Regina, it's great to finally meet you, and I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you might well imagine that as the director of DARPA, I do a lot of public speaking. I don't usually get nervous. The format of this conference is a little bit different. I find it um, definitely unnerving. So I'm going to take a page out of Linda's book, and I'm going to start by singing. <laughs> no, actually, I'm kidding. I'm not going to start by singing. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Trust me, you should not be disappointed. Trust me. Um, most people would expect, however, I think the director of DARPA to begin by talking about the future. I'd like to start instead by talking about the past. October 4th, 1957, to be precise. You might also expect that the director of DARPA would start with something decidedly cheesy and sci-fi. I'm not going to do that either. Okay, it sounds a little cheesy and sci-fi, but it's anything but fiction. Those are the sounds of Sputnik circling the globe, October 4th, 1957 an event that arguably changed the world, perhaps more than you realize. On October 5th of that same year, the headlines of the late city edition of the New York Times read, Soviets launch satellite into space, circling the globe at 18,000 miles per hour, tracked four crossings over the United States, 560 miles above the Earth, visible with simple binoculars. And people looked up. And there was a tension in the country. There was a tension because of the worry, the threat of the Soviet Union. And what looked like technological superiority. Sputnik was a strategic surprise. And the nation was called to action, called to an epic journey to the moon. It was science's time to be daring, and scientists and engineers were heroes in, an, in this epic tale, this epic battle, an adventure to the moon. And it instilled a sense of wonder in children and their parents and their grandparents, and people sat on the edges of their seats waiting to see if we would be successful in this quest. Now, many of you remember this. You remember the sense of wonder that it instilled and the tension that it created, this wondrous adventure and the worry, the fear that went with it. Now that's the tale that most of us remember about that time. What many of us don't know is that those same events gave birth to a little place we call DARPA. Now, DARPA was formed in 1958 by Eisenhower. It had a singular mission to create and prevent strategic surprise. It has been true to that mission for 50 years. And indeed, DARPA is a place where wonder exists every day. Now, when I started at DARPA, we had a little celebration just before on July 19th, 2009, and one of the former directors of DARPA approached me, and he said, DARPA is one of the gems of the nation. Take care of her. 
which is really an elegant way of saying, Regina, this is pretty important, don't screw it up. So we uh, set out in this journey at DARPA to do both the important work of the nation in preventing strategic surprise and in doing and conducting our work, instilling this sense of wonder through the scientific and engineering endeavors of the agency. Now, many of you may not know DARPA. You got a little glimpse of it in the previous presentation. But I will tell you that without doubt, your life knows DARPA. Your life knows DARPA in the development of robotics, as Chris talked about, to do the dull, dirty, and dangerous work. Your life knows DARPA in the formulation of GPS, in microelectronics, in material science, in wireless technology. Your life knows DARPA. And in fact, if we dial forward just a little bit from 57 to 69, we'll talk about the events of that year. Now remember, 69 was the landing on the moon, the culmination of that very exciting race. Some argue it was the most seminal event of that year, seared in our memories. But in 69, something else, arguably, perhaps much more important, happened. And it happened in the quiet of a few labs. Because 1969 was the birth year of perhaps DARPA's most notable invention, the internet. So it began very humbly. Simple idea, connect two nodes together, one at UCLA and one at SRI. A simple yet potentially profound idea. And in that first communication, well, the conversation was a little bit rocky, as it often is in a new conversation. And that first transmission crashed the system. All that got through was the first two letters of the word login, an L and an O. And then a buffer overflow crashed the system. The good news is that doesn't happen anymore, right? <laughs> Who would have thought that four decades later, the internet would be like a new life? Organic, growing, spectacular. It's beautiful in its own right. In fact, science is like art. It is the creation of something new, something that never existed before. And scientists and engineers are artists in their own right. Science makes us question, ask questions about ourselves and about the future. And today, the internet is so much more than those first humble ideas. Today, the internet is commerce. It's a communal mind. It is sometimes vulgar. It is sublime. It is like a vast, networked mirror that shows us who we are and what we will become. And layered on top of the internet is a new, very powerful force in social media. Now, uh, these are the kinds of statistics that we see in the development of social media now. Facebook, 200 million users in less than nine months. Third largest country, if measured against the others. It's phenomenal, indeed. And who would have thought that Facebook and Twitter could become new instruments of strategic surprise? Every bit as powerful as many others. And in fact, the fuel of revolutions and the source 
of even very simple wonderment. So, if we imagine, if we look back after the 2009 Iranian election, when the conventional forms of communication were largely censored, Twitter became the means by which dissidents communicated with each other and with the world. At its peak, over 221,000 tweets in one hour and 2.2 million blog posts with Iran in the subject in 24. And in the uprisings in Tunisia, one reporter wrote that everything that he had learned about those important events, he learned from Twitter, that the entire, the entire uprising had been tweeted. And then 20-year-olds in Egypt who used Twitter and Facebook to change the nature of their country. This is part of the tension now associated with the power of the internet. But as loud as those events were, there are events of equal importance in learning and science and simple wonderment that happen in the quiet. This single red balloon represents an experiment that we conducted in 2009. On October of 2009, we announced what we called the Network Challenge. Our goal was to discover just how powerful the Internet had become. The idea was that on December 5th, we would launch 10 eight-foot red weather balloons in the United States at undisclosed locations. We would pay $40,000 to the first individual or team that would find those 10 red balloons. Now, much as we heard about with the Grand Challenge, some people thought perhaps this silly, some people thought it frivolous, it's anything but. It is the first large-scale social media experiment where there was an adversarial component, and the number of false reports into the system relative to the number of accurate reports into the system was four to one. And the challenge became sorting the false reports from the true reports, and it questioned the very nature of how we define truth in these kinds of experiments. Traditionally, we would define truth as that which we can authenticate by virtue of the source. Authenticate the source, that which comes out is true. It may not be accurate, but that's how we define true. In this particular experiment, truth looked very different. As it turned out, if the reports came in in rapid succession, very close time, and they were the same to within three significant di digits in its latitude and longitude, they were false. As it turns out, if humans are involved, there's natural noise in the system, and that natural noise became reflective of truth. And the MIT students who won this challenge did what people thought completely impossible. They identified all 10 balloons in a remarkable eight hours and 52 minutes. Eight hours and 52 minutes, and that's not the end of it. One particularly connected individual rolled out of his bed on that Saturday morning, sent a tweet to his entire network, and within one hour, he had the location of, all, of seven balloons. One hour. And, you know, just even in the midst of all of that, there were these simple illustrations of the wonder that it created. We have video journals of teenagers who got up in the wee hours of the morning, which I think a remarkable achievement in and of itself, in the wee hours of the morning to search in their entire communities for a single red balloon. We had people who would never have participated in a science experiment of this type participating because of the wonder that it created. And in fact, we need this renaissance of wonder. We need to renew in our hearts and in our souls this deathless dream, this eternal poetry, the perennial sense that life is miracle and magic. We need that in our lives. 
And today, DARPA is a place where that sense persists. Now, I'm clear about the weight of the responsibility of our work. I'm also clear that the urgency and the stakes of that work, they demand something of us. They inspire greater genius. And that greater genius, that inspiration, it can't be created in the abstract. It has to be real to focus the mind. It has to be real to focus the mind. And I'll give you just a little example of things that we're working on today, because nowhere is that sense of urgency, that sense of focus, more prevalent than in the support for operations that we have now. This is a LIDAR image. LIDAR is light detection and ranging. It uses light to image objects in the same way that radar uses radio waves. Now, the color is indicative of elevation. And what you see here is a system that's been under development for years. It uses advances in shortwave infrared sensitive materials, much like you heard about in the last talk, and photon counting detection arrays to do this work. We can detect and use 10 photons to do this ranging. Now, let me give you a sense of scale. A single 100-watt light bulb emits about a billion photons in one nanosecond. We use 10 photons to do this detection and ranging. Previously, that would have required tens of thousands of photons. Now, we were flying the system, shaking the bugs out when I went to Afghanistan. And what I learned in Afghanistan was that many of our military personnel were doing what amounted to controlled crash landings into the sides of mountains for lack of data. And so we said, enough. We need to fly the system in Afghanistan. And seven months later, we were doing just that, flying the system in Afghanistan. And let me give you a sense of the operational importance of this work. The HALO system at full operational capability can map 50% of Afghanistan in 90 days. The previous systems available to do that work would have required three years. It's making a profound difference. So who does this work? Much like we talked about in the time of going to the moon, Scientists and engineers, they are the heroes in this work. They are mostly unsung heroes. So I'd like to introduce you to a few of them. This is Galen and Chris. Galen and Chris are some of the nation's best computer scientists. They came to DARPA and answering a call. We asked them to come for a 90-day Skunk Works activity. That's it, just 90 days. Come and help us understand how to do large-scale data processing in support of ongoing operations. And they answered the call. They came from their universities, MIT and Harvard, and 82 days later, they had their first breakthroughs. And they briefed the vice chairman and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and those military men said to them, great work, go forward. Go forward? Yeah, go forward. And three weeks later, they were in Afghanistan. And I saw, watched, these 25-year-old computer scientists go toe-to-toe -to -toe with four-star generals because they saw something that was important, and it was their way of serving their country. Indeed, why do we do it? We do it because there's something about service that matters. And each of us has a story that characterizes or symbolizes that desire to serve. I have many. I'll tell you just one. On September 12th of 2009, I was at a college football game. There were tens of thousands of people 
ushering into the stadium. There was a buzz about. I was taking my seat, and as I was taking my seat, I got a text message. And the text message was from U.S. Marine Colonel T.C. Moore. And T.C. was in Afghanistan. And his message read as follows. Dr. Dugan, life here is stranger than even Coppola would have imagined. We've just unloaded a helo full of St. Louis Rams cheerleaders. And it was just hours after we loaded the plane with the two flag-draped coffins of the two Marines who died here yesterday. And there I was in the stadium in what seemed to me like a complete bubble. College football fans buzzing all around me. And there I was in text message exchange with T.C. Moore all the way across the world in Afghanistan. And I will tell you that just a few moments later, something absolutely surreal happened. The announcer for the football game came on the speaker and said, I'd like to ask that we observe two minutes of silence in remembrance of September 11th. And the entire stadium fell silent. And I felt as if all of those people were honoring those two fallen Marines. And I wrote to their families to tell them. And those are the kinds of images that are seared in our minds as we serve. And every day when I wake up, it is my goal to be worthy of them. And in fact, I think it's what we all seek. We seek meaningful work of import. We seek that our work is true and worthy of our greatest passions. I don't put boots on and jump out of a plane, but I have found a way to serve my country. And this is my service to country. Thank you.